A wild game it was. 4-3 it finished to Chelsea. It looks as though Manchester United were going to come away with the win, but for those late moments in the game. And really a lot to discuss here, taking a look at the table. And the result sees United remain in six as it stands. At Chelsea moving into the top half of the table in 10th place after that victory. Let's welcome in Frank LaBeouf to talk more about this. But, Craig, let me start with you. What a wild game it ended up being. Well... <clears throat> yes, and that's what happens when you have two big clubs who have spent a fortune and are still a shambles. And that's what you get, a chaotic uh, match that neither can control from start to finish. And if you want to try and go through the match and pick it apart a little bit, excellent from Chelsea at the start, not from United. You know, go 2-0 up, cruising, probably could have gone three up. A, 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 an errant pass from what, from a guy who's short of confidence in Caicedo. United are back in it. Then bad defending from, I think it was from a Chelsea set piece that ends up with United up the field, overload at the back post. Before you know it, it's 2-2. Two -two. I mean, it was almost like United were so bad in the first 30 minutes, Chelsea went, hold on a minute, that's, that's supposed to be us. We're the team. We, we can we can out shamble you. Have a look at this, and they let them back into the game, and then that just allowed for a very open, mm. chaotic second half of football, and we saw how the game finished. So, uh, Pochettino was looking like a dead man walking until he was bailed out at the end, and then it was Ten Hag again, who I think is you know I don't think there's much debate that any of us are just going to and any talk of the top four, you know, even with a win at Stamford Bridge tonight, I think was a forlorn expectation. Mm. That, that, you know, that was pipe dream sort of stuff. Uh, they're never getting anywhere near the top four and he, he won't be near this Manchester United hot seat next year, I don't think. Also chaos, Stevie. What did you take away from it? Well, listen, it was a great game to watch because of it. Because neither team can control anything for any period of time. And when you have Chelsea... <laughs> Albeit trying to go forward, the number of times they coughed the ball up absolutely played into United's hands. That's what they want. I mean, that's just what United is. United's a team that will wait till you make a mistake and then try and use the pace, of particularly Ganacho on that, on that left-hand side. Um, and then they took advantage of that. So, for the two coaches sitting on the bench, let me tell you something, this is an absolute nightmare. Because you're panicking. Because both sides, when they went forward, looked as though they were going to score or they were going to create. And it was just that and that. As I said, great to watch, but, but from a technical point of view, these, these two teams are absolutely where they should be in the league. And, and the fact that at any stage, United thought they would get in the top four, as Craig said, no, no, you're, you're delusional. What did you call it? The Battle of the Shambles? It was the, the, the Battle <laughs> of the Shambles, which looked like Chelsea were going to come out just slightly less symbolic, which they did in the end. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I don't know. Badia Shield, I don't know what Frank thinks about some of the defending, particularly from the Chelsea side oh. or the Man United side, but it was all over the place. Frank? Well, I'm, I'm with the guys, you know. I, I, when I sat down and I said, what I'm going to say, you know, I, I'm very circumspect about uh, um, what I saw today with, you know, of course, like uh, Stevie said, I enjoyed the game because it was fun to watch. But when you, you go a little bit deeper, oh, my God, it's, it's a nightmare. And I would be more severe towards Manchester United because at least they have some players who can call experienced players. And you are 3-2, and they don't know how to, uh, to handle uh, the end of the game. And uh, um, when you see Dalo making that foul, but at 3-3, they are also uh, Chelsea has a counter-attack uh, at four against two. Uh, and it's because Jackson doesn't give the, the, the correct ball to, uh, to Sterling, that Sterling cannot score. That's not what I want to see professionally talking. Uh, Chelsea, I'm going to be wise with them because, you know, I've been severe with, with them la la last game. They are an academy team. They are learning. Some people are saying that they, we start from scratch and we learn from there. <coughs> yeah, they spend a billion, but it is what it is. But really, that's not the way I see football. Uh, well, I see professional players defensively was a nightmare, but not only for Badia Schiel or Dizazi or some others. On, on the second goal with Bruno Fernandes, you have, I think it's Nicolas Jackson and uh, Mudrich with Bruno Fernandes. And as Bruno Fernandes goes towards the goal, <laughs> nobody follows him. 
They don't care. They don't. They're not. They're not. They're not concerned. They don't want to see that. Whatever. Um, of course, the first goal, Caicedo. I mean, so many times we saw that, and so many times we see that in, uh, during the game. But again, I go back to Manchester United. The last goal. How that possible? And the 100 minutes of the game that you're not there, getting the draw and not being concerned as Manchester United players were. That's that's crazy. That's uh, that makes no sense for me. That game was fun to watch, but yeah, if you go deeply, that's that's as 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 Craig mentioned, that was a real shamble. I don't want to hear any words from <coughs> Pochettino now talking about. I know he was on the winning side. Well, this we're on the we're on the, the front foot. We're, we're going in the right direction. This was a great win. Oh my God, no, I don't. As Frank said, dig a bit deeper. It was you got out of jail with this one because this this team, this United side just gifted you back into this game with their inability to just do the basics at the end. And from United's perspective, you've got to give them some credit in some sense because they, lo they already lost a bunch of defenders. They lost Varane during the game. Evans comes on at 36, whatever. He has to go off. And they're, they're already playing with 10 men. And I mean that in the nicest possible way when they don't have the ball. Because Casemiro has gone. Gone. Properly gone. Thank Cannot you. move. You can walk through the middle of that park. And to be fair, you could, <clears throat> you could to both teams. But from United's perspective, <clears throat> you can walk through the walk through the middle of that part. He cannot he cannot get around the field. And when he goes home, when they go home tonight and they fly home, he can sit there and think, well, you know, I've got this big long contract that they gave me. They brought in two hugely experienced players, Casemiro and then Amrabat. And it's, you'd have to argue now that looking at Casemiro, they can't play any of them. They're probably going to have to play Minor and McTominay yeah. unless, unless uh, Ten Hag all of a sudden thinks Casemiro is going to be able to get about the field. So you look at the recruitment again. I know it's not nothing to do with Ineos or just in, but you look at that. He's two international footballers, one who's not playing and the other one who is just sauntering around the field. He either can't get around or is not willing to get around. That was, to me, I don't know about you, Steve, to me that was obvious tonight, particularly early on. I, uh, when he came off, I don't know whether you remember, Kay, when he came off, I turned to Kay and I said, I hope he's playing on Sunday. He did. And, and I'm really surprised because with the experience that he's got, as a player, when you can't get around and you're getting overrun, when you're the experienced guy in the middle of the park next to an 18-year-old, then you bring everybody in and you <coughs> tighten the ship up. And basically what you're saying is, right, if they're going to get at us, they're going to have to go round the outside. We're going to block this up in the middle. And then what you're doing is you're sending a message to your defenders that they know what's happening. As opposed to right now, or what's been happening all season, the back four, whoever it may be, whether it's been Evans or anybody else, they have no idea where the attack's coming from because the middle of the park doesn't shove them to the left and don't shove them to the right. Or they don't block the middle and don't make them go wide. They're, they're, there's holes everywhere. And so, no wonder United are losing goals. Because as a unit, they can't, they have no idea where and when it's coming at them. And there's a, there's a reason why the best teams win games when they're tight. Because they do the basics well. And when I say they do the basics well, mm. they 100 times out of 100 times. The fact that they lose the game because of everybody, everybody going to sleep is absolute nonsense. The people who are good at football and become professionals, the reason they don't play at the top, never mind the ability, it's the basics, passing, control, doing your job. You do those three things, you can be a professional footballer. And if you do them at a certain level, you'll play for Man City or Arsenal or Liverpool. But you can't, you can't turn up and produce that when you play for Manchester United. That, that just tells you that it's the players on the field. You can't blame Ten Hag for what happened with that last goal. That's the players on the field. Yeah, but, what, but maybe you could blame... And I'm, I, I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, but, but, but not in today's, uh, today's forum that we sort of watch the football in, is 
all this talk every time, and we saw it for those that saw the Man City game yesterday against Aston Villa, the most shambolic set-piece wall that Villa put up from the Phil Foden goal when Zaniola turned his back. Now, all we hear about these days from, shall I call them footballing nerds? If there's a different, if there's a more plausible terminology, help me out. But all we hear about is, well, the set-piece coach there for Arsenal, well, the set-piece coach, well, the set-piece coach did this and he did that and he did this. Isn't this wonderful? <clears throat> Anybody talking about it last night with a set piece with a wall? Anybody talking about the set piece coach for Man United? Everybody hides under hides their head under a bushel when it goes badly, but when it goes well, it's always a set piece coach. Mm -hmm. And you know, at the end of the day, we shouldn't read. What I'm saying is, we shouldn't read too much into the roles these people have because at the end of the, it comes down to, and, and that's where people get carried away. Oh, this is just wonderful, the set piece guy and the throw in coach. Isn't this? At the end of the day, Steve, he said, it boils down to how players react on the field. You make decisions. When you're on the field as a player, you can do all your coaching, <coughs> all your walkthroughs, and all your run throughs, and all your shape, and all the other things. But things happen, and you have to make a decision. And as I said, the best players yeah. make good decisions the majority of the time. These two teams are full of players who make bad decisions the majority of the time. That's what you saw today. Frank? Yeah, that's what it is. I think that's, uh, that's where I'm concerned about those two teams. Uh, uh, in football, and especially in our sport, we take initiatives. And that's, that's very crucial in our game. And one player taking an initiative tactically, collectively, uh, defensively, it's also very important that a striker was going to score a goal because suddenly he's going to not control a ball or volley the ball instead of controlling, controlling it. Uh, that's what it is, and that's why our, food, our game is special comparing to maybe other games where you have the tactic, what the, the coaches say, and uh, like in basketball, uh, you, we do the fourth, we do the, th the third, the second, whatever it is, and they, they, they stick to that. In football, you have to deal with elements that you're not in control of. So it's about initiative, anticipation, and those two teams, they, they make bad decisions in a way that, for example, Palmer, Today, who scored three goals, was definitely for me, for me the best player, the best Chelsea player. He sometimes takes bad decisions because he knows that he has to save the, other, the, the, the club in a way. That's the only one where maybe has that level where he can take decisions. And he, he makes maybe too much decision on his own uh, and, 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 and uh, sometimes tries to shoot because he feels that if you give the ball to somebody else, he's not going to score. So it's, what, it's where you have to work at it, it's where you have to feel it, he's still young, so it's, of course, excusable what he does, but you have to have that feeling, and those teams, those two teams, most of players don't have that feeling, they, they, they take bad decisions, they don't secure defensively, and they rush offensively, and, and so sometimes it's fantastic, but most of the time it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's bad to see. Cole Palmer, where would they be without him right now? Wow. 16th? <laughs> 15th, 16th? I mean, <clears throat> that's how, how much they've relied on him. Mm. Uh, you know, ultimately, somebody who was rejected in the end by Manchester City, which is not the worst thing in the world because they have a big squad, but I thought he got... As the game went on, he started to make... As Frank said, he tried to force it a little bit some of the passing and it was a little frustrating, but, but there's no doubt he's the guy that, that's carrying the can for them. But, you know, there's no... I would not trust either of these sides, either of them. If you said to me, Chelsea... Against played, anybody. Against, I mean, Chelsea against were anybody. up twice against Burnley at the weekend, got pegged back at home again. Uh, and in some sense got away with this one tonight. Now, I, I have no idea what the end game is for Pochettino, and that really is going to be the big stories here, is, is the managers, because players will survive for the most part. But, you know, we've seen and heard some crazy rhetoric from Eric Ten Hag over the course of seven or eight months this year, for sure. Last year was pretty sensible. From him, this year has gone full circle. And, 
He's got Liverpool at the weekend, and he always seems to me one of those managers again. He's back in that category of just when you think he's dead. He survives with some sort of a performance, which was the Liverpool FA Cup yep. game. Yep. It's Liverpool again at the weekend. But you got to think Liverpool have learned some great lessons of their wastefulness from, from that game, which it was, and gave United a, an opportunity to get back in, which they took. But, you know, he's, he's dangling, Ten Hag. There is no doubt about it. He is no. dangling. And, and, you know, it's not just Chelsea who are not a good side creating chances. We talk about this every day. I would say if they played Sheffield United at the bottom of the league, Burnley or Luton Town, which they did recently, and Luton created a lot of chances, yeah. barely chance against them, I would be confident any of those sides would would say, do you know what, let's go toe to toe with this Man United side, and I kind of think that's where they are. Ten Hag said his team deserved to win tonight. <laughs> why? <coughs> Could you make I, an I, argument? I really would love to know why. Because, well, they were in a position to win. Because right, they're, they're in a position to win. Exactly. Right. But that's not. But been right, in a that, position and deservedly win. Because that's a completely different matter. Than, <coughs> you know, they got back in the game through nothing that they did. That's, that, which is hard. Which is hard on Garnacho, but it's the truth. They did. They were getting run about. They were getting run around for 34 minutes, and then Garnacho was alive. A life to a situation that may happen. And he pounced on it. That had nothing to do with Manchester United or Eric Ten Hag or any of the coaching staff. It had nothing yeah. to do with it. Chelsea, Chelsea just said, on you go, you can come back in the game. Now, they took advantage of, of, of getting the goal and they took advantage of a Chelsea side that when things get bad, they have no idea what to do. And so from there, from there, it was a level game because we've just sat here and told you about the whole game. It, from that point on, it was back and forth, back and forth. So you, you can't really honestly turn round and say we deserve to win the game. Because the truth is, other, other than a two-minute spell after you scored, at no stage were Manchester United <coughs> in charge of this game. If anybody had any claim to be in charge, it would be Chelsea for the first half an hour. But Manchester United had yeah. no control on this game at all. None. So... Other than you got yourself ahead with two minutes to go, you, you threw it away or, or you, you dropped two points. But don't come out and say you deserve to win this game. That, that is just not true. Do you know, Chelsea Man United, the last 20 years or so, 20, yeah, 20 years or so, been one of the big showcase games of English football in the last 20 years. Really and truly, all that was at stake today was discussions about managers' jobs. Really and truly. Because where, where, where are Chelsea going to end up? They're not going to get relegated. They're not going to get into Europe. They're at best mid-table. And But for a few delusional souls out there, Man United will be playing you know, Europa League football next year. That's where they were going to be win, lose or draw today. And so really what we're looking at here is a fixture between two big spenders and two big hitters in England and the main topic is which manager is going to survive? Because <laughs> they're not playing for it. It's not. They're not. They're not playing. It's not a league title at stake. They're not. There's not really a top four at stake. There's not. There is not. Because United are not good enough uh, to get in there and bridge that gap. And by the way, their goal difference is worse. Anyway, that's another point. Uh, so really, what we're talking about here is two managers trying to save their backsides. And on tonight's showcasing. Pochettino just about saved his because when United were winning and it was going into extra time and injury time, sorry, uh, it looked like he was going to be the man answering all the questions. But in the end, at the end, it's, it's Ten Hag who, who's doing it again. So it's quite sad, really, to see where we are with these with, the, with these two clubs. If we stick with the managers, Frank, and we talk about the risk it would be, the risk it would be to keep Pochettino at Chelsea, or the risk it would be to keep Eric Ten Hag at Manchester United. Which would be worse? Uh, for me, it would be to keep uh, Ten Hag. I mean, uh, again, uh, as I explained before, he has, he has the players that he needs to, uh, <laughs> to, um, to compete in the right way if he, if he has the, the, the player spot on, tactically uh, um, uh, prepared and everything. Um, Pochettino has a little task because of the inexperience of the player and a fair inconsistency. 
is why I would say that Pochino can be uh, guilty for at some point, but not most of the point. I don't want to blame Pochettino for, for what it is. When he signed, I said, well, yeah, OK, he signed, but what he can do? There is not, nothing much you can do. You have to wait for the players to get more experience and to not do silly mistakes like we saw Ka Ka Caicedo. I mean, the first 30 minutes of the game, as Stevie explained, nothing much to say. It's until Caicedo decided to do that stupid um, horizontal pass to Garnacho that uh, Chelsea uh, came into danger. But from Ten Hag, I don't feel the involvement, the involvement, involvement of, the, of that team. I think we reached the, the end of it because we can feel the atmosphere that there, that some players, the experienced players, don't fight for the club anymore or maybe only for the, against the coach. So Ten Hag, I think, I think it might be the time to change because to, to, to refresh, I think, the dressing room. Frank, just real quick, did you have any issue with either of the penalties today? Well, you know, the most I, 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 I watched the first one, you know, I really think that there is a penalty. But at first I say, oh, the knee against the knee is very light. And I would have said, no, maybe um, it really depends on the, on the referee. But I, I think Okura went down um, easily, I would say. The second one, no, I have no problem. You know, there is a kick from Dalo on, um, on the Madueke uh, right foot. And uh, OK, he fails maybe a little bit later but uh, it's because of the of the run and if you watch it live there is no for me no problem for the penalty but the first one i'm still doubting uh, to give 100 percent penalty penalties for you i think once you get wrong side like that then at that pace any sort of contact is you know they're going to give it as a penalty so uh strangely enough i didn't think the one at the weekend was when burnley and Vincent Company wasn't happy, but I think that was more of an arm on an arm sort of thing, almost like a brushing together uh, with the top half of the body, but the bottom half is a different uh, scenario. So, yeah, I, I never felt they were going to be uh, reversed uh, once VAR looked. Well, that's the question. If they hadn't been given on the pitch, would VAR have overturned? No, they wouldn't have anyway. No, no. Not unless it's clear and obvious that it wasn't, and you can't see that looking at both of them. And again, just to, to double down on what Craig's saying, as a defender, when you get caught on the wrong side, it's your responsibility not to get tangled up. Full stop. Mm. Any, any good coach will tell you that. Once you're in the wrong side, you can't touch them. You can't touch them because there's no argument. You, you have no argument as a defender. Well, Diego Dallo, for the Madweki penalty, mm -hmm. <clears throat> he's, a, he's a quick defender, Dallo, but he's got everybody. You know, United had everybody back, pretty much. He's got everybody to his right-hand side. I know Madweki's left-footed, so he may, oh, I don't want him to come in and shoot, but you're taking him into to, you know, six or seven red jerseys there. Once you show him down the line, it's one-on-one. -on -one. That's, that's, that's the risk. I mean, I, you know, it's six and two threes, I suppose, if he comes inside and bends it in the top corner. But that's a difficult skill to do, particularly when you have so many, so many players back. He made a conscious decision to show him down the line, and he got done. He got done by the change of pace, the drop of the shoulder. And he never complained, by the way, uh, Dallo, when he was down. It was yeah. Fernandez and the others that were complaining. Dallo knew that, but you can always tell by the reaction. You know, uh, Anthony was that, very guilty. And uh, Dallo, no complaints whatsoever. He knew it had been done. He knew it was wrong side. But still that being said, there's no excuse for United switching off, even from the position they were in at 3-3. They switched off from the set piece, and that's what done them in the end.